we are very happy to have uh, Richard Zheng, almost Dr. Richard Zheng, uh, talking to us about his thesis work. This is the uh, Richard's dissertation talk. Um, so Richard did his uh, undergraduate uh, degree in uh, Cornell in WE. Then he went off uh, to work in industry for a couple of years. And then he saw the light and came to Berkeley. Um, <laughs> but, but really, you know, Richard is really a true engineer, you know, deep down. And I think, you know, if we were back in the 60s, Richard would be the one to, to you know, design uh, the, the, the moon landing. Because Richard is really, <laughs> no, it's like, you know, the, 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 the engine, like, the old school, like, NASA engineers back, of, of, back in the day, when you actually just do everything right, do everything by the book, and measure everything, and, you know, make sure all the air bars are there, and that the air bars are small, and just, you know, do it right as if somebody's lives depend on it. Uh, that's really how Richard approaches research, and it's been really refreshing uh, to see this, uh, and, and that, that it's... The, if you look at Richard's papers, you know, they're all beautiful pictures, of course, because we have to have beautiful pictures, but also lots and lots of graphs and charts and plots with proper air bars, everything, you know, done with minute attention to detail. And I think this is, this is a really uh, uh, wonderful uh, feature of, 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 of Richard's work. And, um, and, and also, I, I, you know, he's, he's also, uh, you know, this has this nice... Uh, blend of, you know, super laid back and cool and, you know, cooking lobster for, you know, for a group dinner and also just really passionate about the stuff that he's doing and, and you know, willing to, in a very calm and laid back way, you know, take, take a stand and say, no, this is, this is how it should be. And uh, Richard is probably the only one I know who has, who has bet against uh, uh, Philip Cranbill and won. Because one of the first things that Richard is going to talk about was a pro problem that Philip tried and he didn't, it didn't work out. And Philip said, it's impossible to do, cannot be done. And Richard did this. I think it was, uh, you know, I'm still looking for something where I can, you know, win against Philip Cranville. So I think this is, this is quite, a, yeah, quite an accomplishment in itself. In any case, uh, we're very happy to, to have him uh, present his work. And we will be sorry to miss him if it so happens that he graduates. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks so much for the very generous introduction. Um, <laughs> all right. So this is image synthesis for self-supervised representation learning. So deep nets are extremely adept at going from a noisy high dimensional input to a clean low dimensional output. For example, a deep net can tell us that this here is a rockfish. Now, by solving this heavy compression task, the network actually learns about natural image priors. But the world doesn't often give us these nice, clean labels to learn from. What we're much more likely to see is something like this, just raw, unlabeled pixels. What if that's a signal that we have to learn from? Can we get a network to produce a high-dimensional output and solve these graphics tasks? Is it a matter of just taking the last layer of the network and stretching it out so it produces a nice grid of pixels for us? Well, it turns out not to be the case. In a high-dimensional output space, a lot of things can actually go wrong. Now, in this talk, I'll address a number of image-to-image -image synthesis problems. But let's first start off with a nice, simple, motivating example. That is the problem of image colorization. So how hard could this possibly be? You have an input grayscale image. You try to predict the color components. And if you've done a good job, you can concatenate the input and the output and hopefully achieve a plausible colorization of the input image. So we were hoping this would be a nice one to two week project. We could just take this problem and pump it through this canonical kind of deep learning framework. Right? That is, we have a whole bunch of data, x, y pairs. When we take grayscale images x and color y, we can have a deep net f parameterized by theta. And that can help take us from the grayscale image to the color image y. We can measure our progress using some sort of loss function l. And we can adjust our parameters theta across the training set to minimize this expected loss. So we went ahead and did this, and we were hoping to get really great results. But instead, we got something that looked like this. And you can see here that all these images are kind of bland and desaturated and just not very realistic looking at all. So this is not the type of quality that we really want to, want to have in the end. So what went wrong here? Well, let's do some introspection. So if we take this image of the bird 
we can note that we don't actually know what color this bird is in actuality. So this bird could be blue, it could be red, it could be many different colors. And if you use some sort of naive loss function, such as Euclidean loss or L2, which is kind of a reasonable thing to start with, you'll just get the average between all these different possibilities and end up with something that's sepia-toned and, and kind of decolorized and unrealistic. So we see that um, kind of in image-to-image -image translation problems, there's this inherent multimodality that you have to take into account. And if you use some sort of naive, naive loss function, such as an L2, um, that, won't be in a, that won't be so adequate um, for this problem. So what we do instead is recast the problem as one of multinomial classification. So that is, for every single pixel, we predict a distribution of possible colors that it could be. And here's what that might look like. So on the upper left, we have um, an input image of a bird. And here on this chart, each one of these tiles corresponds to one of the output bins in our, um, in our output space. And these are subsamples for visual clarity. And now within each of, one, each of these tiles, regions with high lightness indicate high probability of that pixel being that color, as predicted by the network. So if we zoom in here, we see that the network is predicting that the bird uh, should be blue, red, maybe purple. And the background vegetation is green, yellow, maybe a bit brown. So these seem to be sensible predictions. Now there's one final step that takes us from this predicted distribution into a single point estimate that hopefully will give us a nice uh, kind of plausible colorization. And we can look at some of these results here. So on the upper left, we have an input grayscale image. If we use L2 regression, it turns out that actually does just fine for this image. That's because there's very little color uncertainty as to what color the sky is and what color the vegetation is. And classification does, our classification system does just as well. But we saw that with this input image of a bird, using L2 regression will actually give us this desaturated, unrealistic bird, whereas with our system, we get a nice blue bird with a nice yellow belly. Now, if we look on the left here, this is the actual color, the ground truth color of the bird, which is yellow. And even though it's far apart from the bird that we produced, we're perhaps just as happy with our bird because it's nice and colored um, and um, vibrant and, and more realistic. So we've seen that um, really in these types of problems, one very important aspect is to account for the multimodality. In this case, we accounted for it um, by recasting the problem as one of multinomial classification on the output space. OK. So we took this um, system and decided to have some fun with it. So we applied it to some legacy black and white photos. Uh, for example, here's an iconic photograph of Yosemite Valley Bridge by Ansel Adams. And here's our result. Here's an image of a thylacine. And this is an animal which went extinct in the 30s. So there are actually no known color photos of it. And here's our result. OK, and here's a family photograph um, from the 50s from China, and this is actually my father and my great-grandfather. And this is our result. Okay, well, methods can make mistakes, and ours is no exception. So one problem that we see is that man-made objects can actually have multiple different colors, and when they have a large spatial extent, our method can have a difficult time resolving which one to ultimately go with, and that gives us this kind of um, displeasing kind of tie-dye pattern that doesn't look really realistic. So our method can make mistakes. But there's actually a more fundamental issue at play here. So if we consider this image of migrant mother, if I were to ask you what color her face is or what color the skin on her arm is, you'd have a pretty good guess because you and also the network has seen tens of thousands of humans upon training. So this is really no problem. But what color is her shirt? Well, we don't know. That could be one of many different colors. And even worse, we don't know what color her children's shirts are or what color the baby's blanket is. They can all be different colors, actually. So, so we see that this output space is actually combinatoric in nature and highly multimodal. Now, if we look at our result, we, pick, we have an OK result, but it can only pick one of these modes. And around this time, two other methods came out concurrently. And if we look at their results, they actually pick a very similar mode as well. And if we look at the aggregate of these three results, they're actually coming nowhere close towards exploring the full possible output space that, that we're dealing with here. So kind of motivated by this problem for SIGGRAPH, we developed a user-guided system which allowed a person with a few different clicks, a user with a few different clicks, to come in and colorize the image as they want. So with a few clicks, they could get something like this, or they could change it around and change the color of the mother's shirt and the background, or they could do something like this if they wanted. OK, so here's um, kind of an overview of what our interface looks like. On the left, we have an input grayscale image. On the right, we have initial colorization as predicted by the network. So right now, the network is predicting that the cup is red. 
But the user might have actually wanted a blue cup to begin with. So what they can do is come in and add a single blue point on the cup. And now conditioned on the grayscale image and the single blue point, the network is actually able to successfully propagate that point to the rest of the cup. And we have an, an interactive colorization of a blue cup. And no, notice that this point has been colorized across the stripes. Um, and that's actually a fairly difficult thing to do here. OK. But we also noticed that there's kind of this undesirable artifact um, in the brim of the cup. right? The network got a little bit overzealous. So there's this um, undesirable kind of shading artifact inside. So the user, upon seeing this, might be unhappy. But they can go ahead and come in and add a single gray point um, inside the brim of the cup, and that can fix this, this artifact and remove it. And now you can actually take this um, original point in the beginning and use it kind of as a control point and quickly change the color of that original point um, using some suggested colors given by our, our interface. And that allows the user to actually very quickly flip through the possible modes in the output space here. And if they're unhappy with any of these discrete choices, they can actually um, look at the continuous color palette on the upper left here and choose any color that they want. OK, and our system will update in, in real time. OK, so how does this work? Well, before with automatic colorization, we had a deep network that took us from input grayscale image x to the output y. What we have here is just an additional input, and that's these user points. So we can simply feed these in as an additional input to the network. And notice that before we were um, handling this kind of multimodality by doing classification on the output space. Over here, we're actually relying on the user to resolve the multimodality. So very quickly, um, the user will actually choose what mode that they want. And so conditioned on the input grayscale image and the user points, this problem very quickly becomes unimodal, which means we can actually go back to using good old regression. And in some um, sense, that makes our life easier. But there is this kind of difficulty with training the system. So with automatic colorization, it was actually very easy for us to get XY pairs. We could just download a bunch of color images and make them black and white, and those would be our Xs and our Ys. But here, with user-guided colorization, we have this pesky term U, which is kind of these user interactions. Now, it's very easy to go on the internet and download millions of color photos. But getting kind of millions of user interactions, having someone sit down and do that for us, is likely to get expensive. But there's also another problem. The user behavior is actually going to um, depend on how the system behaves. And of course, we can't even get a system to begin with without having these user interactions. So we have a chicken and egg problem here as well. So we have to bypass this in some way. Now, what we found is that you can actually simulate the user data um, by just randomly simu uh, through random simulation. So what we can do is take the output color y and randomly reveal a few of those points and we can use that as kind of a proxy or as a fake kind of user interaction. And so from the network standpoint, you can think of these randomly revealed points as sort of hints that the network gets. So it gets to take a little bit of a peek at the output y. And based on that, it tries to guess the rest of it. OK, so here's what some of these hints might actually look like for our cup. So the number of points that we have is drawn from a geometric distribution, which means that with some small probability p, in this case 1 8 the system actually gets no points and has to do completely automatic colorization. But most of the time, we're actually giving it the benefit of having a few points to take a look at or take a peek at. And with some small probability, um, it gets to see many, many points. And the reason for that is we want the system to keep um, kind of integrating the user input if the user chooses to continue to engage with the system. And we're able to do that in, in this way. OK. So now, um, by training it this way, the network can learn how to integrate these hints um, in a learnable end-to-end -end framework. So it can take these points and propagate them to the rest of the image in whichever way it sees fit. So it can use anything from kind of low-level texture cues to high-level um, semantic cues, whatever it needs to solve the problem. OK, so if we take this example image, um, so this is of my grandparents, we can see that we can quickly flip through different colors in the background as well as um, colors on my grandmother's shirt. Now, I actually put this in my paper. And the other day, I was scrolling through a few, another paper, and I actually saw this image of my grandparents pop up. <laughs> uh, so this can sometimes happen if you put things on the internet. OK, but of course, if you give this type of system to a person, they're going to want to have some fun with it. So we all know what color elephant should be. But what we really want is, is a pink elephant. And our system is actually able to follow the user's um, guidance and whims on this. 
And this is actually really interesting to me because upon training, it actually never saw a pink elephant. It only saw naturally colorized elephants. So this is actually free emergent behavior that comes out of our system, even though we never really um, explicitly specified it. Okay, and we can also take this actor's face and try a few different colors, and maybe green works the best here. Okay. Okay, so note that we set up the system so that um, it can integrate some sort of user hints or user guidance um, towards the output colorization. The way we specify these hints were in the form of these individual points. But we're actually not constrained to this design decision in the end. So we can just as easily take these points and swap them out for something completely different. For example, a global color histogram. And now we can actually train basically the exact same system, module a few different kind of um, architectural changes we have to make, and get a completely new way or different way that a user can interact with, with the system. For example, we can try this kind of style transfer technique. So here we have this input image of a bird. And we can colorize it using the color histograms of these different inset images. And if we have well-matched pairs of images, we can actually get results that look like this. So this is a completely different way for a user to come in and kind of navigate this multimodal output space. Okay, here's a different example with some balls. And one example I like is on the upper left because we took this kind of unrelated lorikeet image and we were able to repurpose its colors for, for this input grayscale image. Okay. So we actually got a lot of mileage out of this uh, colorization problem, but what we're much more interested in is the general problem of image-to-image -image translation. That is, um, trying to take um, an input domain A and translate it to an output domain B. So, so for colorization, we were able to define some kind of reasonable ways that a user could come in and interact, but in this kind of arbitrary setting, uh, we don't have that benefit. So what we're going to do instead is borrow this trick from machine learning called this latent code. And so this latent code is a low dimensional vector that should hopefully describe all the possible variations in the output. Now at test time, we don't necessarily have the benefit of a user either, but we'd still like to be able to draw samples from this somehow. So the trick we're gonna use here is we're gonna fashion this latent code so that it can be easily sampled from some sort of prior distribution, for example, a, a normal distribution. And that way we can easily draw samples upon test time. And this is what our system will look like at test time. Okay. So this problem of um, image to image translation has been uh, kind of explored in, in the literature um, in the past few years. So you might have seen this uh, really great work from Yusol et al called Pix to Pix. It can do amazing things, for example, going from an edge map to a photograph, uh, going from a map to a satellite, or going from a label map to a facade. So the way to read this label map is that each one of these colors corresponds to a different semantic category. So there are you know doors, windows, awnings, um, background, facade, et cetera. Okay, but here, multimodality actually kills us again because pix to pix can actually only produce one plausible output, and it's a nice output, but it's unable to actually predict the full distribution that we're, we're dealing with here. So for, for this example, you can think of many different facades with different colors and textures that all correspond to this label map. And pix to pix isn't able to give that to us, and we'd like to be able to capture that full distribution. Okay, so the way pix to pix works, uh, high level overview is you have an input image, you have some sort of network, um, here we're gonna call it G or the generator, and it's gonna create a predicted output. Now we need to judge this output in some way, the quality of this output. So one way we can do that is take the ground truth image and put some sort of um, per pixel regression law such as L1. Now you may have guessed that if you do this, um, it's not gonna work so well because if there's any sort of uncertainty as to kind of where the edges are, um, some sort of per pixel loss function will simply average between all of them and give us a blurry output. And that's not what we want. So what um, Yusol et al found was that they could borrow this trick from Goodfellow called generative adversarial networks. And the idea here is that instead of just having an L1 loss, you also have another loss called D. Now this D is actually itself another neural network. And that neural network's job is to tell this generator G if what it's predicting looks like a real image or a fake image. And now, guided by this discriminator, the generator is actually able to produce results that look much more realistic and pleasing. Okay, now everything here so far on this board is deterministic, which means that it can only produce one output. So we have to add stochasticity in some way to be able to draw multiple samples. So we're going to use um, this latent code that we discussed earlier. And so we can actually train the system like this. So we pass it random latent codes, and if all goes well, 
then this latent code will actually learn to capture all the possible variations in the output. For example, the color, texture, um, and any kind of structural variations that might be possible. Okay, so we trained this hoping to get great results. And on test time, what we actually see is something like this. So here I'm drawing random samples, and here I'm playing a video. And in this video, um, you actually see very little kind of changes. So a little bit of change to the tone, um, but really no kind of texture or structural changes at all. So right now, this is not working. This is not capturing the full output distribution. So this problem in the GAN literature is actually known as mode collapse. And so the idea is that a lot of different latent codes are actually mapping to the same or at least a very similar point on the output space. Right? So there's a kind of a many to one mapping, and that's not what, what we want here. Okay? So we're going to have to somehow combat this, this kind of behavior. Now, why does this happen? Why does the generator effectively ignore the latent code? Well, it doesn't need the latent code at all. So before, it was perfectly happy solving the problem, even without this latent code. And now, all we're doing is giving it some random numbers that really have no meaning or no use. So the generator just says, hey, I don't need this at all. I'm just going to ignore it and do what I was doing before. Okay? So what we're going to do is to try to encourage an invertibility between this latent space and the output space. So before, there was this kind of many to one mapping. What we'd like is something that's more bijective, a one to one mapping between the input and the input latent code and, and the output. And there's several ways that we can go about doing this, and we explore this in this NIP paper. So one way you can do that is you can start with a random latent code, pump it through the generator, um, predict an image, and you can actually take a 180 from here, pass the image back through an encoder, and try to recover the original latent code that you had. And you can encourage that with some sort of L1 loss. And so here we're actually cycling between the latent and the output back to the latent in hopes of being able to kind of have this invertible mapping. So if we do this, um, we also, of course, want output images that look realistic, so we can still put a discriminator on the output side and make sure we're generating pretty pictures. Okay, so if we try this and we run it at test time, here are the kind of results that, that we get. So we see that now we actually start seeing some kind of nice variation on the output that we didn't have before, so that, that's definitely good. That's the behavior that we did want. But if you look through this video, um, you see that there are a bunch of frames that come up that actually don't look so good. And they might look something like, like these here. And you see them come up you know, 15, 20% of the time. And this is bad. So um, the problem here is that this system, even though it's better than before, it's still suffering from mode collapse in, in some way. And the reason we believe that's the case is because we're going from a low dimensional vector to a high dimensional output space. And then we're trying to recover that low dimensional vector back. So it's potentially actually very easy for this generator to hide the latent code in this high dimensional output in some kind of imperceptible way. Okay? So kind of motivated by this, we can also try the other direction for encouraging invertibility. So we can go from the output image, pump that through an encoder, predict a latent code, which is low dimensional, push that through a generator, and try to recover our original ground truth image. So here we're also cycling between the latent and the output. We're just doing so in opposite directions. So here we're going from the output to the latent back to the output. Okay, so we can train it like this, um, but the problem, or the problem is that at test time, of course, we don't have the benefit of ground truth images, which means that we have to still get our latent codes in some sort of way. So what we can do is go back to our kind of prior distribution and draw random samples. Now, of course, if you do that, we get results that um, are not very realistic at all. So um, almost none of these images look um, are of kind of the quality that, that we're shooting for. Okay. Now, why is that? Well, if we look at this, the, um, during training time, the latent codes that we're getting are being encoded from the ground truth image. But at test time, the latent codes we're getting are drawn from this prior distribution. So there's going to be this kind of mismatch between training time and test time for this latent distribution. And that's causing us problems. So to get around this, we can use um, this really neat um, tool called variational autoencoders from Kingmo and Welling. And the idea here is that um, instead of having the encoder um, deterministically determine um, the latent code, we're passing it through a noisy channel. Right? So the encoder is going to predict a probability distribution, and we're going to sample from that probability distribution to get the latent code. And then we can put a loss between this predicted distribution and this prior distribution um, and try to keep them close to each other. Okay, so 
One way of looking at this is we can look at it from the generator standpoint, okay? So the generator, it gets to cheat. It still gets to cheat. It gets to actually take a direct look at the ground truth image, but it has to do so through this noisy channel. And we're constraining this noisy channel so that it's providing as little information as possible. So we're really forcing the encoder and the generator to work hard. And we're hopefully reducing the kind of domain gap between the latent codes upon training and testing by doing this. And now if we train it like this, we get results that look much more realistic, realistic than, than before. So this is good. OK, so in these last few slides, we explored a few different ways of encouraging inver invertibility in the system. So on the left, and we have you know, the first system, and on the right, we have the, the second, the variational autoencoder. Now, these different models have actually been proposed before in the unconditional GAN literature. But one of our contributions is to note that on a meta level, these two models are actually doing something very similar. So both of them are actually cycling between the latent and the output space. They're just doing so in opposite directions. And in both of these cycles, in the middle, they're doing some sort of distribution check, either on the latent code or on the output. So really, they're doing something very similar. So we wanted to see if kind of the um, intuitions and kind of benefits of both these models uh, would, could be combined together to give us results that were more realistic and diverse. And so our model is actually using both these. Um, and we can draw a box around it. And since there's two cycles, we call it, we call it bicycle again. OK. So we can take our system and try it on this label to facade problem. And we can get results that look like this. So now you see that there's different colors, structures, and textures that we're capturing. So this is great. And uh, of course, this is a general system as well. So we can apply it to, for example, going from edges. Um, we can try to generate different types of shoes. And we see different patterns there. We can go from edges to different handbags. And we can take a picture at night and imagine what it might look like in the day as well. So here you see different kind of cloud patterns and, and vegetation patterns. OK, so here we have a single input image. And we're using a bunch of different latent codes. We can do the opposite. So we can also have a whole bunch of different input images. And we can apply the exact same latent code across all of the input images. And by doing so, what we actually see is kind of consistent changes in what you might call the style of the output image. So you're seeing consistent structures, or in this case, colors and textures on all these, all these shoes here. And here you're seeing kind of the, the cloud patterns are, are pretty consistent, and maybe the lighting as well. OK, great. All right, so for the next part of the talk, we'll be uh, kind of describing how the network or looking into how the network might actually be solving this task. So on this problem, it seems like the network underneath the hood has some sort of notion as to which regions belong to the sky, which belong to vegetation, and which belongs to buildings. Now, if we look at our colorization network, we see some interesting behaviors as well. So if we have um, this image of a dog and we colorize it, we immediately see something strange um, that, that's going on here, right? Does anyone want to venture guess what that is? Who hasn't seen the slide before? <laughs> OK, so this is the top, so it's bleeding. That makes me unhappy as well. But there's something else as well, right? And so one thing that really confused me at first was these kind of pink regions on the chin of all these dogs. So at first, when I saw this, I thought something was terribly wrong. I must have some sort of horrible bug um, in my code. But then we flipped through kind of the training code and saw that almost all the dogs had their mouths open and their tongues out. So the network, of course, went ahead and, and learned this bias. right? So even when the mouth isn't open, the network is happy to go ahead and hallucinate a tongue for us. So this is a failure for sure. But I think it's actually a very interesting failure. Because if you look at this region kind of in isolation, there's absolutely no reason that it should be pink at all. The only reason that it would be making this mistake is if it somehow had some notion as to the dog's face um, in its entirety. And that's actually something that's, that's very interesting. We wanted to look into this property a bit further. So one way you can do that is take the network and visualize which types of images maximally stimulate certain types or certain units or hidden neurons within the network. And we can do that with this uh, kind of visualization technique from, from Bolezo. If you do that, we see different units that correspond to what we call stuff categories, such as sky, trees, and water, and other units corresponding to thing categories, such as faces. Sure enough, our dog faces show up, and flowers. 
And we found this interesting because the network was actually able to discover these different structures or patterns in the visual world, even without the use of any sort of semantic labels on top. So it was able to, um, it was basically trained, basically just using raw data um, to train itself, right? We took a raw image, broke it up into its color and grayscale components, and trained a network just based on that raw data. Now this type of training in the literature has recently been called uh, self-supervised training. And um, there's been kind of a flurry of activity in this space in the last few years, but we actually went back and found an older reference by uh, Virginia Artisa from NIPS 1994. And this is a really cool paper. The idea here was that if you can take the raw pixels of a cow, for example, and the raw um, audio waveform of the sound moo, if you could associate those two somehow, you've presumably learned something about how the natural world actually works. Now recently we've seen kind of a more modern take on this by Andrew Owens, and we've also seen a whole bunch of different papers using different types of supervisory signals um, that are in some form raw data. For example, ego motion, um, in painting, kind of contextual cues, um, video prediction, as well as kind of more what we call unsupervised learning, such as generative modeling um, and autoencoders and denoising autoencoders. Okay, but if we take a step back, really the goal of all the self-supervised and unsupervised work is not really dissimilar at all. All this work is trying to set up some sort of pre-training scheme that tricks the network into having some sort of useful high-level representation in the middle without the use of, of labels upon training time. Now our work is actually not that unlike that of autoencoders and denoising autoencoders, so we'll um, go ahead and explore this connection. So a traditional autoencoder looks to predict um, an image from itself, but of course this is um, really a trivial thing to do. You could just learn the identity function. So you have to stress the network out in some way, and the way to do that is to either add some sort of bottleneck in the middle, some sort of low dimensional bottleneck, or some sort of sparsity constraint. But overall the idea is that um, the hope is that the autoencoder will be able to induce some sort of abstraction by compressing the data. Well, this is a really great idea, but it turns out on large-scale data, it doesn't work so well. Now, one way of trying to kind of stress the network out or make the network work harder is what's called a denoising autoencoder. So the idea here is you take the input image, you corrupt it in some way. For example, you can drop out half of the pixels, and then you can ask the network to try to recover the rest of those pixels. So from half the pixels, recover the other half. And the reasoning here is that um, for the network to successfully do this, hopefully it'll have learned something about the natural image manifold or about how natural image statistics actually look. But it turns out denoising autoencoders actually uh, don't work so well either. What we have is actually um, stressing out the network in, in kind of a much uh, larger way. So what we have is kind of a cross-channel encoder. So the idea is we have raw data X, we're dropping out half of the information, that is the color information, we're holding that out as a label and we're forcing the network to predict the color information, the color channels from the grayscale channel. And so we're actually trying to induce abstraction through prediction. And that actually ends up working a lot better. The problem here, though, is that this network can only look at half of the data, right? Because we've held out X2, or in this case, the color channels, as, as a label. So in the case of colorization, this network is quite literally colorblind. And that's not good, because we actually want to be able to extract features on the color channels as well. Okay, so what we tried to get around this is actually the simplest thing and actually worked surprisingly well. So what you can do is um, have one network predict color from grayscale, but you, you can also take this task and flip it around and predict the grayscale channel from the color or chrominance channels. You can then take these two networks and concatenate them together and actually achieve a full representation on the full input image. And actually if we take a step back and kind of squint our eyes a little bit and draw a box around this whole system, we see that the aggregate of the inputs and the aggregate of the outputs is actually the full image itself. So this, in a sense, is an autoencoder, from, at least from the objective standpoint, it is an autoencoder. The only difference is in the architecture. There's this kind of split in the middle, which is causing both halves to have to predict, um, to do this kind of difficult prediction task. So we tried to give this a fun name. We called it a split brain autoencoder, and that's a play on an older paper by Jan LeCun called Optimal Brain Damage. Okay. And so you can take this and apply it to images by predicting chrominance from luminance and vice versa. But you can also take this and apply it to any sort of tensor. For example, you can predict depth channels from the input RGB and, and vice versa and get a representation on the RGBD kind of connect data as well. Okay, so to test this, what we do is we take the weights we learned, we freeze them and train linear classifiers on the intermediate layers to do some sort of supervised task. So the idea here is that if the um, network actually has high-level abstractions, 
um, inside of it. After the fact, it should be extremely easy to linearly separate them in that feature space. Okay, so we're doing unsupervised pre-training, and then we're freezing everything and using supervised learning as kind of an evaluation or kind of a probe into the network. And if we do this on the y-axis, we can have classification accuracy. On the x, we can have the layer in the network. We see that with random initialization or L2, we get kind of very bad performance. If you do supervised pre-training, um, so this is actually training with the benefit of labels. You get this kind of monotonically increasing curve here. If you use, um, now we can kind of evaluate different unsupervised or self-supervised objectives as well. So if you use autoencoders, you get this pink curve, which is a bit better. If you use denoisy autoencoders, you get this red curve, um, which buys you a few points, but really doesn't help much. Um, so if you use our colorization or cross-channel encoding, we get kind of a big boost on top of that. And if we use our split brain autoencoder, we get a, a boost on top of that as well. And to show you that we're kind of serious, we can um, basically take this uh, kind of evaluation metric and compare it to kind of previous concurrent work. And we see that our system is actually performing um, above kind of previous systems um, on this test, uh, which is actually very nice to see. And that, it was actually very surprising to me because this is actually relatively simple. All we're doing is taking um, this input tensor, cutting it in half, and training a network to predict one half from the other and vice versa. And this actually worked surprisingly well, we found. Okay, so we've taken these features and we've tried to see how well they, re they can be repurposed at some sort of high level task, such as classification. In the final part of the talk, we'll also be looking at how well these features work uh, towards predicting something low level, um, in this case, human perceptual judgments. So this is joint work with Adobe um, that will be appearing in CVPR this summer. Okay, so this task of low-level image or patch similarity, similarity has been a long-standing problem in graphics, and it's actually extremely difficult. So if I take this reference image and distort it, and I ask you what the kind of dis distance is between these two patches, perceptually, that's obviously kind of a, a bad question for me to ask. There's no number you can give me that would really make sense here. So I can actually ground the problem in a way that's a bit better. So what I can do is take this reference patch, and then I can show you two distorted patches, one on the left and one on the right. And then I can ask you which one of these patches actually looks more similar to the one in the middle. So I'm actually going to ask you this now, OK? So if you think it's the one on the left, please clap. And if you think it's the one on the right, please clap. OK, great. So you and all humans that I've tested this on <laughs> have picked the one on the right. But it turns out L2, or PSNR, or signal to noise ratio, will actually choose the one on the left. And so this may not be surprising to you because PSNR actually looks at each one of these pixels individually. So it has no notion as to what structure is as, at all. Um, so it's kind of very famously and notoriously known to, to very, be really bad at, at blurry images. But you might be surprised that SSIM or FSIM actually picks the one left as well. So SSIM stands for the Structured Similarity Image Metric. Um, and it's kind of the de facto metric that's used in graphics and vision papers for kind of doing this, um, this kind of similarity test. And it actually ends up choosing the one on the left as well. So what we wanted to see is if deep networks or deep network embeddings actually gave us a distance that corresponded more closely with what humans would tell us. Now, there is some motivation for why we might believe this to be the case. So many of you may be familiar with this work from uh, Gattis et al where you can take deep network feature responses and use them to do this um, style transfers, to, to kind of make this image look like a painting and give you something that's kind of perceptionally uh, pleasing. And we have, uh, we've seen kind of recent work on this uh, label to image problem as well. So this is a generated image, um, basically using deep network responses as the loss function. Okay, so in the literature, this has been um, called a perceptual loss. Using deep network responses has been called a perceptual loss. And the community has coalesced around a single design choice. That is using the VGG network architecture pre-trained on ImageNet classification. The way they do this is given two images, let's call them X and X0. You can pump them through the VGG net on classification. Then you can compare how far apart these two kind of uh, feature, um, these feature stacks are from each other on every layer. Um, using cosine distance. So what that essentially amounts to is normalizing the channel direction, subtracting them, um, and then taking the L2 norm, and then um, averaging in the spatial dimension, and then averaging in the channel dimension. And that'll give you one number that tries to estimate how far apart these two, these two patches are. Okay, 
So what we wanted to ask was, how well do perceptual losses, which is VGG trained on classification, how well does that actually correlate to human perception? And if it actually does correlate with it, then does it absolutely have to be the VGG network architecture? And does it absolutely have to be pre-trained on classification? OK, so to help answer these questions, we collected a whole bunch of triplets, just like the one that we did all together here. And we measured how often different metrics agreed with the human judges. So on the left here, we have L2, or signal to noise ratio. Um, and it's at around 60, 68.9%. Now, this task, um, in some sense, can be kind of ambiguous. So human-to-human -human agreement isn't going to be at 100. It's at 83. And we're going to measure, basically, the progress we can make from this L2 up to human-to-human -human agreement. OK, so if we look at low-level metrics like SSIM and FSIM, they actually don't do so well in the wild. And they're you know one or two points above L2. But if we look at VGG on classification, or what's being called a perceptual loss, that actually does quite well. That's actually making up a lot of the ground between L2 and human-human agreement. Um, so that's actually a nice confirmation that what everyone has been calling a perceptual loss in the literature actually does indeed correspond well with human perception. So here we'd like to see if uh, it has to be VGG. So we tried different networks, such as AlexNet or SqueezeNet. And we found that these networks, trained on classification, also correspond well. And actually, interestingly, um, the bigger networks and the deeper networks, for once, actually don't do don't do better, necessarily do better. And that's interesting to see as well. From here, we wanted to see, does it have to be pre-trained on classification? So we took AlexNet, and we grabbed some networks that were pre-trained on other unsupervised or self-supervised tasks, and ran them on this kind of test as well. And we saw that things like puzzle solving, um, bigans, which is generative model, as well as our own split-brain autoencoder actually correspond um, well with human perception. And what we even found was that if you go back to basically the first machine learning algorithm you ever learned, that is uh, k-means, and you apply k-means to deep networks, that actually works pretty well um, j just by doing that. So the idea here is um, to get your comp one weights, you run k-means on um, image patches, and those cluster centers become your filter weights. You freeze everything up to that point. Then for comp two, you run k-means on comp one patches and get um, and those are your COMP2 filters. So this is basically kind of the first machine learning algorithm you would use. And this actually works extremely well. So um, this is kind of an unsupervised kind of, um, kind of training scheme as well. So I think what's interesting to see is that some of these bars are higher and some of them are lower. But all of them actually correspond quite well, even across uh, supervisory signals and architectures. But very importantly, you have to look at some sort of data or sol solve some sort of objective. So if you just take the network and set it like randomly, that really doesn't give you much. You have to absolutely, you absolutely have to look at some sort of data uh, to get good performance here. OK. Uh, so what we've seen before our work is that deep networks could be trained on um, discriminative tasks um, using kind of a large scale label database. And if you do that, you can solve the discriminative task. And you also are able to learn about the visual world. Now in our work, what we've done is try to see if deep networks could actually be used to synthesize images. Now, this can be a little bit difficult because um, in this high dimensional output space, um, oftentimes graphics problems are actually multimodal. Um, so you have to take that into account in some way. But if you're able to do that, you actually are able to learn some sort of feature representation underneath the hood as well with kind of this raw unlabeled data um, in this kind of self-supervised way. Um, and that, that's kind of great to see. OK. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, a whole bunch of people and many more that I couldn't fit on the slide uh, for my time here at Berkeley. Um, so of course, I'd like to thank um, Alyosha uh, for being a really great, great advisor um, and letting me into his group and everything. Um, so Alyosha is probably like the nicest advisor you can imagine. Uh, I know like in my fourth year, things were not necessarily going great. Um, but Alyosha was always very encouraging and saying that things would all be OK. I don't know if he actually believed it, but Turns out I'm, I'm going to graduate. Um, that's, that's really nice. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Trevor and Mike and Jitendra uh, for being on my quals and my thesis committee. Um, I'd also like to thank Avde. Um, so I spent two years in Avde's group, which was really great. Um, yeah, and also I'd like to thank uh, Phil. So Phil's a postdoc that's going to be starting as a professor at MIT soon um, that I've had the really great opportunity to work closely with. Um, one thing I learned from Phil is to really be precise about, about everything. Um, um, one thing I've learned, yeah, I've seen that what Phil does is, if anything is kind of unnecessary in a paper, um, 
you should really just remove in and really just try to produce the kind of simplest thing that you can uh, in a paper. I think that that's been really great. Okay, and then finally, there's you know a lot of people in Baird that I like to thank, but overall, um, one thing I found is that everyone um, kind of in our community is just so nice, right? Like I remember when I was a younger grad student, I um, like emailed Barack for some random segmentation with some random segmentation question. He wrote just this really long email um, back, so that was like you know really nice of him and. I've had kind of similar interactions with, with everyone here. OK, um, so if you'd like to get more information on um, some of the stuff we talked about, you can go on the website for kind of code, models, additional kind of experiments and such. All right, thank you.